Welcome to Island Baptist Church. Today's Bible study is Lesson 8 in the Book of Job, titled, A God You Cannot Figure Out, Part 2. So uh, this, this Bible study has been, uh, not, to, not that we don't cross some um, um, unspoken boundaries, I guess you could say, in Bible studies every time we're together. It's not my goal. Uh, I don't come out here trying to just tell you stuff that you don't already know. Uh, but I, I don't think you come for that. I think you come to, I don't want to go to Bible study to tell me one more thing I already know. I want to hear something that, that I don't know. I appreciate the, the, the Bible teachers and preachers who are not afraid to say, uh, to cross lines that have been, whether accurately or in, in most cases inaccurately drawn. And a lot of times just because we, we make assumptions. Like I said, I've known the Bible all my life, so therefore I don't know it. There's nothing you can teach me. Well, um, that just because you said that tells me you don't know it well enough, uh, because you have an assumption about what's running around between your ears that it's a little bit too high. Uh, we're never going to, if anything, Job is certainly an example of that, and he's going to give Job a lesson about how well we don't know God, and how unlikely it is that we ever will know God fully. Uh, in, in fact, I would, I would say to you very clearly, you will not ever know God fully, because it's not, you're not capable of it. Again, back to the shepherd and the sheep. So a sheep is going to know his shepherd fully someday? No. No, they're not. A child's going to know his parent fully as long as he remains a child, no. Now, grows up into an adult and experiences what adults experience, but you're never going to grow up into be God, are you? So you're not going to know him fully. And it'll be fine. It won't, it won't bother you at all. But we, we, we need to be put in our place. And part of, part of our Job study has been the purpose of Job, I think, in the Bible is to put us in our place. It sure did put Job in his place and his friends. And they were the uppity-ups, you know, they were the super smarts. They were the guys that had it all together. Job was the best man in all the East. Uh, they, were, they, were, they were the it's of the day. And uh, you may think you're the it of the day. And uh, the book of Job is for you. It really is. It certainly is for me. So we're going to be in Job 38 is where we're going to be starting and going down to Job 30, uh, 42. We're going to be looking at several places. We're, we're basically jumping the entire middle section, more or less, with some comments that we've been discussing uh, the, the, the friends and their problems and that they knew everything about God. And so did Job, by the way. He agrees with them in their positions. He effectively says to them, I, I know what you're saying to me, and I believe the same thing. The problem is, is that our conclusions were wrong because there's nothing that I have done. And what I'm experiencing is not related to anything that I've done. And his friends, his Job is sitting on the inside saying, listen, I'm telling you, it's not the way we thought. His friends are sitting on the outside, so no, we know it's not true, Job, you're a sinner, you need to tell us what you've done, you know, because no one ever suffers unless he's been sinning, and we know that, and we have this erudite understanding of the way things work, and God fits in a box, and, uh, and nothing's outside the box, because we, just, we voted, and heaven is a, is a democracy, don't you know, and anyway, a lot of false thinking there that leads to false conclusions and bad uh, acting, and so, so that's where we are, so... We'll start there in just a second, but let's, let's pray together, and uh, let's thank God for our time together, and then also just ask for His help, as always. God, we do thank you that we've had a good time together. This has been a heavy study, and uh, heavier than most, it seems. Uh, there's a lot of conclusions that we have that are needed to be tested, and a lot of conclusions that come straight from your scriptures that we've never, um, never thought were true. So God, I pray that you would take us from where we are to where we need to be, as you say, growing up together into the full knowledge of all that we're supposed to be in Christ, each part of the body doing its work, uh, growing together in love. God, I thank you for your great love for us. I thank you that you can be trusted. Uh, and I thank you that this, this book, among many, uh, teaches that very thing. Thank you, God, for this time. Thank you for these that have been faithful, God, I pray that as they go back to their respective congregations and ministries, and God, I pray that they would take a blessing from you through us uh, with them uh, back to wherever they are, uh, confidence to stand on your word, confidence to, to teach others about you. Thank you, God. I pray you bless our time now, open our eyes and our ears and our minds, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. So, so Job is, uh, spends the middle chapters with his friends basically saying, I hear what you're saying, I used to believe what you believe, I don't anymore, here's why. Because I sit on the inside of this saying, it's not what it is. <laughs> you're telling me that I have to sin in order to have these experiences, and you're saying I'm not perfect, but nonetheless I haven't done anything that brought this about. And they simply can't accept that. 
And so God has to take them to task, and then he takes Job to task. And he's going to answer Job down here in verse 38, and we'll, we'll see that in just a second. But the last time we were together, we saw several things that are very important. Number one thing that's important is to understand you're not going to fully figure God out. Anyone who thinks he knows something does not yet know what he ought to know. Like I said, you tell me you know everything, you automatically tell me you don't know everything. Automatically know you do not know what you ought to know. Because the, the, more we, the more you truly know, the more you realize you do not know. The, the mark of a maturing Christian is that he knows for sure he doesn't know near enough. The mark of an immature Christian is the one who's, like I said, you've got God all in a box, and the world's all in a box, it all works a certain way, and that's an immature person. Uh, we need to be patient with them and understanding for them, but also need to make sure they're not in charge of anything because <laughs> they can cause big problems. You didn't want Job's friends in charge of anything because they were the worst of the tools of Satan. I would submit to you they're the worst. Now, Satan took away his family, took away his health, took away his income, but the friends... Okay, here's, here's, here's the, again, the danger. The danger of being like Job's friends is that you can be tools of the enemy. The statement that Jesus makes to, to, to uh, James and John when they want to call fire down from heaven right on the city who wouldn't let them pass through. We're just going to come to that town. And they say, well, no, because you're headed to Jerusalem. We don't want you coming here. Let us call down fire from heaven. Jesus said to, to two, two big disciples now, one of them was the first martyr, the other one wrote a, a significant amount of your New Testament, John. He says, you two do not know the spirit that you're of. That is always a danger. Oh, I'm only controlled by the Holy Spirit. I wish that was true. But I know that it's not. Just because you have the Holy Spirit does not mean you're controlled by the Holy Spirit. That is a false assumption. Again, where are you getting your Bible study from? Not from the Bible. You're making assumptions. The Bible says you must be filled with the Holy Spirit. That means it's possible to not be filled and be controlled by something else. So it's not a question of demon possession or you're, you're possessed by the Spirit of God, but are you controlled by the Spirit of God? Well, that's a decision that you've got to make every single day, and in some cases, every single moment. Be careful. How do we know we're in the control by the Spirit? Because the fruit of the Spirit comes out of us. One of those is gentleness, patience, kindness. We can add to that, not assuming you know everything. I mean, these are all qualities of the, the, the control not the possession of the Holy Spirit, but the, the control of the Spirit in our lives. Uh, that's the way we know. So, so, uh, so we have Job here coming to some, we came to some conclusions together about Job in the, sense, the same sense as children. What's the most important thing for a child? So you need to know how the bank accounts work and how you're trading stocks and what's going to happen with the, I don't know, over the next projected time period. You need to know your pay salary, how you're distributing out and how you're saving for the short term and the long term. And all. You, you share that with your nine-year-old? Of course not. Number one, he can't get it. Number two, it's too much for him. He's a child. Leave him alone. Let him be a kid. That kid needs to know two things. He needs to know, know, number one, that he is loved and that you will lay your life down for him. He's your child. Number two, that he can trust you with all decisions, especially the ones that he can't understand. That child will have a great childhood. Way to destroy a child is to take, him, take those two things away from him. And share with him a bunch of stuff he doesn't need to know. He won't mess him up. We got a lot of messed up kids and adults today because that's what happened to them. I had a great childhood. You want to know why? Because my parents didn't sit down with me very much. <laughs> they just did not. You boys go fishing. You boys take your rifles and take off in the woods. And mom and dad are going to take care of stuff. And it was a great life. I wished I could have that back. I would love that. But, you know you got to grow up. You know, it's sad. It really is. But having a childhood like that was just awesome. It really was. I knew that I was loved. I knew my parents could be 100% trusted. I knew my parents were not perfect. They were not. But when my parents were imperfect, they made sure they declared it. Because a child can see that. They know it. So there's, there is some, there is not a, there is, it comes to a place where there's not a point of comparison between us and God and our relationship as parents to our kids because you're never going to get to the place where you see God's imperfect. And you're never going to see him have to come back to you and say, you know what, Daddy was wrong about that. Never. 100% trustworthy. But even in an imperfect relationship, as much as my parents were good and great and we had a great home, even an imperfect relationship, it, it still is huge, a massive blessing. So in a perfect relationship, in a perfect family that God has, you're the only imperfect part of it, me and you, um, 
you know, there is tremendous blessing just knowing that we are loved and that we can trust him 100%, that he's doing the right thing, that his perspective is something that's way beyond. Like I said to me, when I was nine years old, 10 years old, was how many 22 bullets do we have? That was the whole issue. Do I have enough line on my fishing pole? I broke it off one time. I remember we were riding, on the, riding the back. We only had one bicycle between us at one point. And I was, my brother was, the seat wasn't big enough, so I was sitting on the seat. He had to stand up to pedal. You know, we were taking off, headed somewhere fishing, and we had one pole between us, and it had, it had, a, it had the reel, Zebco 202, and it had one eye on the end of the rod. And I somehow, don't know how, got the tip of that rod caught in the spokes of the bicycle and just chopped it smooth in half. Anyway, we, we still went fishing, though. I didn't end a fishing trip. We could, fish, we could pull line off of it and fish with our hands. We were not going to quit. That was our whole concern, you know. Did you skin your knee? Did you cut your foot? How many fish did you catch? Great life. That's, that's, that's the kind of life God wants you to have. Uh, compared to the things that you need to know, the, uh, the things that are to know, and the real issues that are going on, that's kind of what your life is. Even though you've complicated it and think it's a whole lot more important and vastly more complicated than, than that, it's really not. You can trust him. He loves you. He's taking care of you. You've gained a, you've gained a wealth of 99% of all that you need to know right there. So Job, Job is, is still thinking he can know more. And so we were his friends, and that's part of their problem. And uh, so, so we're going to consider what, how God deals with that. But first I want to tell you about a guy by the name of Antonio Gaudi. Do you know who he is? Antonio Gaudi? I'll give you a dollar. If you, give you an A, A plus, if you know him. You don't know him because you don't live in his day, but if you lived in his day, which was the end of the 1800s and the beginning of the 1900s, you would have known him very well, especially if you lived in Europe. He was a very coveted architect. He was really good, sought after by kings, queens, premiers, heads of state, wealthy people, because he could design things. He just had a mind that could see things unlike anyone else, and he could make it to the buildings or whatever he was, you know, floor plans or whatever, to a degree that was just far superior. He started his life's work, his masterpiece, called El Templo de la, de la Sagrada, Familia, the Church of the Holy Family in Barcelona, Spain in 1882. He did a lot of other stuff, but his main project for, for the majority of his life was building this basilica there in uh, Barcelona, Spain. Came to the point where he had, they didn't find out a lot of this stuff until after he passed away. He basically made plans that he knew would far outlast him. In other words, there was no way that the plan for this church would ever be finished in his lifetime. He intentionally set it up that way. The complicatedness of it, the size of it, the, the cost of materials and the funds that would have to be raised uh, to build it. Clear, and this man was very, very intelligent. He clearly knew he was setting up something. In fact, to this day, they're still working on it. And this man, Tony Gowdy, passed away in 1926. So we've already, we've already reached the century mark since he's passed away, and they still haven't finished his designs. He intentionally set it up that way. But I want to tell you his story. So, so he, he just is this famous guy and is, is just coveted and worth millions of dollars and could, could name a price to do anything he wanted to for anybody he wanted to pretty much in his day. And uh, like I said, his life work was this, this church of the Holy Family, it was, as it was called in Spanish. And uh, he, he starts building on the site, and he eventually moved to the construction site. Inside the, what, was, what had been constructed by that point, he built himself this little shack that just had a you know, coffee maker and a bed in it, and it had a place to sleep, and it had a, had a, a way to heat and cool himself. And uh, that's where he stayed for the rest of his life. Uh, he died in 1926. He was on the far side of Barcelona. He had gone over there to visit someone and was on his way back and was walking down the street. He was, in, he was in his 80s by this time. Wasn't moving fast enough. You can understand, right? Got ran over by a tram. Did not kill him. But it, it injured him to the point where he did die. And the reason why he did die is because he was dressed like a tramp. Uh, didn't spend money on clothes. Didn't have, a, didn't have any identification. Didn't have a dime in his pocket. Worth millions. I mean, he was just this famous guy. And uh, so when they picked him up, you know, he was severely injured, uh, but they put him in a, in, in a poor person's uh, hospital on that side of Barcelona because they figured he, there's no way he could pay, you know what I mean? You can't put, put him in a nice place. 
And so for two or three days, his friends, he didn't come home, and these, you know, fabulously wealthy, powerful people were looking for him, couldn't find him, and they finally found him in this, the last place they would think they would find him, in this pauper's uh, hospital. And, uh, of course, they immediately put things together to move him to the very, the, get the best medical care, the best, you know, everything, doctor, everything. He refused. He said, why would I go over there? He said, my place is with the poor people, just as much as God's place is with the poor people. And he stayed there and he died as a, re as a result of his injuries. And uh, he was, uh, again, he died in 1926. He started building on this basilica in 1882. And uh, at the time of his death, he was only about 20% finished with the plans that he had made himself. By uh, his, his, his plans are not, they, they, they think that they will be finished by 2032. So 10 years from today, for, from this year. So that's the kind of, he, he established that kind of system, and he was often asked why he would do something like that. He was often well known for just creating these elaborate plans. And with regards to his building of this church, he said these words. He says, my client, referring to God, is not in a hurry. <laughs> Isn't that true? Is it not true that we're involved in uh, an epic story? We're involved in it, but it does not end with us. It did not start with us. We, we get the privilege to be a part of it. But actually, it's not about us. We're players in it. But it's a tale of many characters and vast battle scenes and millions of intertwining subplots and many perplexing twists and turns. And so I want you to hear this because so, so, it puts our life in perspective with regards to our client, if you will. Life is not a short story, and you are not the star. It's not. It didn't begin with you. It will not end with you. You were never the star of it. The star loves you, though cares about you, loves the part, and wants you to play the part that he created you to play, if you'll let him. Now, I will say, the part that you play may not be fun all the time. In fact, it may be really, really sad. Is that okay? It's just an acting role. You're just coming all in one side of the stage, and you're going to go out the other side of the stage, and it's going to all be over. And uh, by the way, you're going to be rated based on how you did. So you're ready for that. Is that okay? He can take, and it's all his stuff, by the way, and he can take you the time that he's given to you, the short time, and, and, and use it for his glory and use it to your benefit, even the stuff that you may not like. It may not be fun in the time you're experiencing it. Can you trust him enough? Can you trust him to know that he's going to do what's best for you, that you're going to be ha you may not be happy in the short run, but you will be happy in the long run? Like I said, Job was not happy with God. Do you think he's mad at him now? I don't think so. You can use my short life and all the stuff that I was going to lose anyway for an eternal weight of glory of this beautiful book that teaches people to get over themselves and to stop thinking that they're the theme of the short, and this is a short story all about them. Yeah, that's a great story. I would, if he got a chance to repeat it again, he would say, yeah, do it just like that. Just, just, the, just the wise and, and, and uh, amazing and omnipotent way that you did it before do the same thing. Can we not do the same with our lives today? God, just be, be the awesome God of my life that you want to be. And, and don't, please, I, I, I know I try to vote all the time through my prayers, but please don't listen to me. You know? <laughs> don't, don't change anything, please. Do, do what you sovereignly decided you were going to do anyway. I'm going to be happy with that. So, so, but back to whole, the whole issue of trying to figure God out, and that was the thing, just trying to, trying to figure God out. Look at the, the issue of having God figured out in our minds. Like, like I said, if that's you, uh, I know a couple things about you. Number one, you have problems, and you are a problem. Because that's exactly what the friends of Job were. They had God all figured out, and they had problems because of it. And they were a problem. They were the worst tools of Satan, even though they came in for the right reasons. You're familiar with the term... Um, well-intentioned dragons. A well-intentioned dragon is one who comes in with all the right intentions, but every time he opens his mouth, he breathes fire. <laughs> but I didn't mean to. Yeah. Because you think you know what's going on, and so you say what you think, and then boom, you burn stuff down. That's the friends of Job. We're capable of that, and that's part of the purpose of Job's book, to shut us up, 
to make us think less of what's going on between our ears, which is critical. So follow the logic. When I think I've got figured out, I've got God figured out, then, then he approves of the things I approve of and disapproves of the things that I disapprove of, right? He's got him in a box. He just like, I've got him figured out. It also implies that God must think just like me, which, which ultimately means then if God is just like me, then it makes me perfectly capable of judging you, doesn't it? Because, see, I don't have to, you know, God's just like me. So the automatic thing that I go to in my thoughts is where God would go, and therefore, you know, I can hit you right straight over the head with it. That's what people do. That's what we do. Some of the worst ones are Christians because they think they know more, and they do. But if you think you know more, if you think you know a lot, you automatically tell me you don't know everything that you need to know. Instead, we need to know that God loves us and that he can be trusted, and that's the message we need to convey. Uh, again, if I think God just thinks like me, I think, you know, I know God, that's what, he, that's what he would do. I know what God would say in this situation. Are you sure? Are you sure? Well, in a short Bible study, we've assaulted a lot of positions that we've held classically. Again, I ask the question, where are you getting the theology from? Think you know the Bible? Because you read it, I don't know, ten times? I mean, you know it better than most. Because most haven't read it. But be careful what you do with that information. Sometimes information doesn't make you anything more than dangerous. That's not the goal of the Scriptures. The goal of the Scriptures is not to give you knowledge. The goal of the Scriptures is to change your life. So if you know stuff, but it doesn't change your life, well, what use is this information for you? God's not just giving out information. His goal is not to make you smart. His goal is to change you into a person who is useful to Him, who's actually make it, who actually is a representative of the nature of God. That's the goal. Knowledge, no. No. Why would he call a sheep? Knowledge is not going to be our best asset. It just can't be. It just can't be. We'd like to think that it is. So, so I, I, because I know God, because I talk to him all the time, you know, and he tells me stuff about you. <laughs> so there you go. I'm afraid of people like that. And you need to be. They're dangerous. Like I said, they have problems and they are a problem. Be careful, people like that. I've got God all figured out, so I've got you all figured out. You need to give some, our, our hard and fast conclusions a well dose of reality. Here's, here's a couple of doses. Number one, it's going to hurt. God is not an American. That's breaking some of your hearts, isn't it? I remember when I realized as about an eight-year-old kid, Jesus wasn't an American. I don't know, I mean, not that I was ever told that he was, but I just assume in the Bible he's speaking English, and he's a good person. All those people are, are Americans, as far as I was concerned. I was watching the Waltons, I'll tell you the story, watching the Waltons, so they were saying, good night, John Boy, good night, you remember that? And then the little girl, the little red-haired girl, can't remember her, Elizabeth, maybe? I, she said something, I had no idea Jesus was Jewish. And that's the first time it dawned on me that Jesus was an American <laughs> Really? So smart I was. So smart. So, number one, God's not American. Number two, God's not Republican. <laughs> no, he's not. And number three, this is the worst one for me, God is not a gun owner. Never owned a gun. Never fired one. I don't trust people like that. My aunt, Karen, some of you know her, she married a man when I was about 10 years old, and uh, this man was from the big city, I think, of Dallas or somewhere, and uh, that was back when she had bought this pistol. She was working in places and working in places where she needed self-protection, and she had bought this 38 revolver, and we were going to go down the hill from my parents' grandparents' house, and we were going to fire it. And I never, I were not ever allowed to touch a pistol, but I had a gun in my hand. If it was, if it was, if, if a single leaf fell from a tree, I had a gun in my hand. Out from the time I was born, I mean, I literally had, I don't know how many, uh, I still have a few guns. <laughs> but we went down the hill with this uncle of mine at this point. He was, had, had become my uncle. And uh, we were going to fire this 38 Special. I'd never fired a pistol before, but I didn't know how a gun worked. And I was, you know, it's got a lever on the side. You roll the cylinder out, and you put bullets in it, and you click it back in, and you pull the hammer, and you point, point it in the direction of something you want to kill, because that's what will happen. 
And we were, I was carrying the pistol in my pocket. I have no idea why. And I pulled the pistol out and handed it to him butt first because that's what you do. And he was just, don't point that gun at me, son. Something like that. And I just thought my, my immediate assumption from that point on was this man, does, he has no clue. Everything in my world had to do with, if you knew what's the business end of a gun, you did not know what the business end of a gun was or how to catch a fish. Well, I have very little use for you. <laughs> very little. Because that was the epitome of all, you know, the great, thing, great things in life. All my heroes, my dad and my grandfather, were men who knew those things very, very well. So, I don't know where I was going with that story, but it was a great conclusion somehow. <laughs> well, that's, that's what it was, gun owners, right? Raised with guns. God's not a gun owner. He's not. And you may think, well, yeah, and I'd have thought more of him too. Yeah, he's not like you. He's not. Not going to be. He does not think the way you think. He does not understand the world the way you understand the world. His understanding, his comprehension, in fact, it's far, far worse than just a few issues that he differs from you on. Do you not know? Have you not heard? The everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, does not become weary or tired. His understanding is unsearchable. Not going to figure out how he thinks. Can't do it. Here's the Holy Spirit declaring in God's word that that will not happen. Your mind and his mind are not going to meet. They can't. You were created in a deficit with regards to that. You're not like him. Created in his image in the sense of a trinity, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, right? Body, soul, spirit. You're a trinity in nature. But you're not, you got it, don't have it going on up here in order to search out the things of God. It's, it, like I said, it's worse than that. Romans 11, here's Paul, all about a great mind. He certainly was compared to most of us. Especially me. Oh, the depths of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. He knew a ton of stuff, didn't he? Wrote half the New Testament. How unsearchable, there it is again, are his judgments. Why he does what he does, not will know it 100%. And his paths beyond tracing out who has known the mind of the Lord or who has been his counselor. A lot of people think they are. And like I said, they're dangerous. They're dangerous. We vote when we pray, right? No. You're not, not known as mine, nor are you as counselor. You will not be that. Ever. Not your capacity. Not your job. Not, not your ballywick. Nothing. It's not what you've been called to do. So, so here's some conclu conclusions about that. God may very well accept people that you will never accept. Is that okay? I think one of the things that are going to be in heaven, we're going to get up there and say, what is he doing here? The other thing I'm going to say a lot is, why isn't she here? Because God decides that. God may accept people that you may never accept, that God may very well do things that you will not agree with. Because. Because. Like I said, back to our kids and our relationship with them, when they're, especially when they're young. So the kid understands all why you're doing what you do and agrees 100%. Even if you got 50% of the time, your household was peaceful, wasn't it? But you don't get 50%. You may get 20, maybe 10. Kids don't know. They're not supposed to know. Also means that God may like things that I don't like and allow things to happen that I will never understand, ever. Now, we're going to know more when we get to heaven. You're never going to know it all. Because like I said, it doesn't, there's not a clause here that says until we get to heaven, even though we put that in there, but where does it say that? It doesn't say that in the Bible. It just says you're going to get up there when people say, well, I'm going to have all these questions to get to God. I don't think you will. I think you're going to get there, you're going to realize the thing that mattered all the most was that you're loved and you can totally trust Him. Yeah, when the information comes, you're like, oh, that's a nice thing. But it's not going to matter near as much as it does today because you and I have a high opinion about run, what runs around between our ears. You're not going to have it up there. You're going to be at fix. That's one of the biggest fixes we're going to get is the, 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 the humbling of, uh, from where we are today, even though we turn, talk about, about humility, and I'm big on humility and try to seek it out as best I can in my life, but I know I'm nowhere close to what it really, really needs to be. It just, it's going to be a part of it, and it's going to have a whole lot less. It's going to do away with a ton of our questions. I believe that. So that's just his understanding, though, right? So we're not even got to the place of his person. So you and I may be able to understand the same things, 
Does that mean you understand me? That's altogether different. So you can't even come up with what he knows and understands, much less now how are you going to understand him? He's far, way out there. Way, way out there. If, but built into the demand that Job makes and his friends make, Job particular makes, built in that demand for God to explain himself, here's, here's, the, here's the assumption, that God is like him. See, when, you, when you're determined to know why God does what he does, you're assuming that you're like him. You're not. You're assuming that your minds can meet. They can't. You're assuming, here's the worst thing, that you're a peer of God. You are not his peer. Not any more than a sheep is to its shepherd. They're not peers. Their minds do not meet. They do not. The sheep needs to trust the shepherd. Bottom line, period, nothing more. Not going to figure it out. That you think like him, that you reason like him, that you're on the same level in him. And that's essentially what we want when we want an explanation. Because there's an assumption in there that we can understand the explanation and that our mind's going to meet here. God and I are going to, I'm going to have a conversation with when I get up there, the man upstairs. No, you won't. If, I mean, I guess if you will, if he allows it. But what makes you think you have a right for that and have the capacity for that? He's not your peer. Our mind and God's minds are never ever going to meet. We are not created that way. But Job demands a meeting of the minds, and so God gives him a taste. And that's where we are in Job chapter 38. Let's take a look. So Job has been uh, effectively halfway through the book, stopped having a direct conversation with his friends, even though his friends continue to berate him because they don't know what spirit they're of, and they continue to lambast him. And Job just continues to have this basic conversation with God in which he says, I wish God would just come and talk to me. I wish that he would come and see me. I wish that we could have a conversation. I wish that I could lay my, my, my uh, uh, plight out before him. Oh, I wish for the day in which I could do all that. So, you know what? You can be careful what you wish for because you just might get it. So here's what happens. Job 38, then the lobe, then the lobe, <laughs> then the Lord answered Job out of a whirlwind. Why? I don't know. Because he can do whatever he wants to. He could have done it out of a fire. He spoke to Moses out of one of those a couple different times. Out of deep burning and a huge cloud and rumblings and all kinds of things, right? And then a still small voice. He can do however he wants to. He comes to him in this very um, over-the-top way, I guess you could say. He makes these statements. Who is this that darkens counsel by words without knowledge? Wow. This is the smart guy. No offense, but I would submit to you smarter than anybody in this room. We, we, we confuse technology with intelligence. There's not the same thing. His Google is up here. Where's yours? I can tell you where my, mine's right. If that dies, which it did, I'm in big trouble. <laughs> I'm in world hurt. Because I don't know a lot. Back then, they didn't have these kind of options. They held it all in their ear, between their ears, and they were smart people. Really smart. Joe was superior. Listen to his friends and him in their conversations. Nothing like your conversations. There, there's not an ain't and a them are good and, or anything like that in any of these conversations like there would be in mine. <laughs> Super intelligent. Who is this that darkens counts about words without knowledge? Now gird up your loins like a man, and I will ask you, and you instruct me. So since you're big and think that our minds can meet, and that we can have a one-on-one -on -one conversation that you're going to keep up with me. Let's just make sure that we're on the same level. So let me give you some tests here. You tell me what you know. Where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? You didn't get a chance to answer because there's not an answer for that, right? Or an obvious answer. There is an obvious answer. Tell me if you have understanding. Who set its measurements? Since you know. Who stretched the line on it? On what were its bases sunk? Or who laid its cornerstone when the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy? Where were you in all this, Job? Where was your understanding? You have all, apparently you know all this stuff because that would be what was required in order to have a conversation with me. Who enclosed the sea with the doors of the bursting forth when it went out from the womb? And when I made a cloud, its garment in the thick darkness, its swaddling band, and I placed boundaries on it, and I set a bolt in doors, and I said, Thus far shall you come, but no further. And, and here shall be your proud ways. These are all under, under, the, under the heading of a question. Have you ever 
in your life, command of the morning and cause the dawn to know its place, that it might take hold of the ends of the earth and the wicked be shaken out of it. It, it is changed like clay under a seal, the earth is, and they stand forth, the, the continents basically, like a garment. And from the wicked their, their light is withheld, and, and the uplifted arm is broken. Have you entered into the springs of the sea, or have you walked in the recesses of the deep? Have the gates of death been, been uh, revealed to you, or have you seen the gates of the deep darkness? Have you understood the expanse of the earth? Tell me if you know this. He's just giving them a taste of what, of course, God does, which is all things, and uh, putting him in his place because Job had gotten out of it. Because, and he doesn't stop there. Of course, we have four chapters of questions like this, one after another. Since you know all things, then you must know this. Since you think you know and you can question me and call to the meetings of the minds, let's make sure that our minds can meet, Job, because here's the stuff that I know. And, of course, the answer to all these questions, of course, I wasn't there, and, of course, I don't know these things, and, of course, and, and well, here's, here's, the, here's the best answer, because Job gives a good answer. Job's a great guy. He, he's, he's way, again, no offense to anyone here, but he's better than all of us. <laughs> I'm convinced. This guy is stellar. Notice the way he responds to God in chapter 42. So four chapters of questionings. 43 questions total. And then finally, God stops and Job is able to rebut, if you will. Here's his rebuttal. Job answered the Lord and said, I know that thou canst do all things and that no purpose of thine can be thwarted. That, that one is one you need to really get. There is no counsel outside of God's. There is no more information outside of God's. We're going to talk about that this Sunday. No purpose of thine can be thwarted. Who is this that hides a counsel without knowledge? That's the first question God asked Job. He says, so let me answer that question. Here's the answer. Therefore I've declared that which I did not understand, and the things too wonderful for me, which I did not know. Here now I will speak, and I will ask thee, do not instruct me. Here's God another question. I have heard thee by the hearing of the ear, and now with my eyes I see, therefore I retract, and I repent in dust and ashes. He said, I think I'm just going to shut up now. That's what he says. That's a good answer. That's, that's a good answer. Because there's nothing for him to say. There's just simply not. I think I'm just going to shut my mouth at this point. It's great having a God that we cannot figure out. You would not want it any other way. You would not want God to be able to meet minds with you. You do not want a God who you can spar with. You do not. It would be the worst thing for you. So I'm a sheep, and my God is basically a superior sheep. That would be so sad, because the world is full of wolves. They're way smarter, armed far better. We're all going to die, because the God that I have created for me, because he's not the real God, is a God who is just as vulnerable, basically, as I am. That's what we're looking for when we're trying to answer these questions and really trying to have a meeting of the minds. Tell us, God, why you do such and such. Well, maybe he will. And maybe he won't talk to you about that. When I make God in my liking, what I like what I like, believe what I believe, know what I know, approve what I approve of, I make him in my image, which has many problems, not the least of which is that he's too small. Way too small. That would be super bad. Because I meet many things, most things I meet in life are bigger than me. So I've got a God that's my size, who's going to help me? Where's my help in all this? So, so since God is for us, right? Since God, is, who can be against us? Well, I'm telling you, if you have a God that can, you can figure out, your enemies can figure him out too, and you're in trouble. Big trouble. So you notice the, man, the, 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 the religions of the world have their gods, and their gods are superior to them, but not largely so. They basically think the way we think and act the way we think and react the way we react and because that's the way we create our gods. You do not want a God that is in your image. You want a God that's far superior, in fact, vastly superior. We need to understand, as, God, as much as we possibly can, we need to understand God. I'm not saying we shouldn't. I mean, why does he write a Bible and give us tons of information? For stuff for you to know. But you also need to understand of all the things there is to know, he's not giving you much. 
He's not. There's, there's stuff that we simply can't explain, we don't understand, we don't know why he does certain things and when he does them and in what way that he does them. We can't see those things. The, the intent of the Bible is to tell us, first of all, that he loves us and that he can be trusted. And that we can't trust ourselves. Again, that, that theme is just constant in the Scriptures. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not in your own understanding. In all your ways submit to him, and he will make your path straight. Do not lean on your own understanding, because it is flawed. Not just flawed, it is limited. Even if you had the understanding of Adam and Eve, God wasn't sitting down as best we can tell with Adam and Eve and explaining to them how the universe worked. They weren't built for that. They were built to have a great time in the garden. My brother and I were riding, up, riding down the street with a fishing pole. They were intended to have that kind of life. That's the life that we're headed to. That's the level of enjoyment where we can totally trust and totally feel loved and feel free to operate within that trust and love. That's what you're created for, not to be, you know, eggheads. Not created you that way. He could have done that, but he didn't build you that like that. He built us in a system of trust and a relationship of a father to a child, and that's going to be a permanent situation for us. Not that we can't understand him to a degree, not that we shouldn't try to what he's given to us, but the bottom line is, is we got to learn how to trust him. We need to realize that there is a limit to understanding. There's not a limit to trust. It just could go on and on and bigger and bigger and bigger. Wow, look at all the stuff that I can't know. I just get to trust him more. That's a great thing. That's a great thing. You know, back to being, being a child, looking up to my father, who was a great man. And I didn't, didn't understand him. It, I didn't care. Did it bother you? It didn't bother me a bit. Because I knew my dad was a good man. I knew that he loved me. And that he was going to do his best. I didn't have to hold him. Nobody had to hold him down about that. He was going to do his best. And if he messed up, he was going to be good about that. He was going to talk to us about it. I knew that. And that boom! I went back to having fun. Joy of my life. Because that's what kids do. That's what they should be able to do. God, we're, we're, as much as what we're going to come to understand about God is the thing he's been trying to teach us all along. Hey, you can just trust me. I'm going to do what's right. And right is going to be the best thing for you. You're going to love it. You're going to be happy about it. Let me be in control. You'll love that. It's awesome. You know, the whole Jesus take the wheel thing. What were you doing in the front seat anyway? <laughs> what makes you think you're riding up there? You're in the back. You're in the trunk, some of you. You need to be anything that needs a lock back there. Sometimes I've got to be in the trunk because I just cause problems. Jesus, take the wheel. Man, you're not his co pilot or nothing. You don't advise him. You don't get a vote. You don't want to vote because your understanding is flawed. It's dangerous. You're only, yeah, I shouldn't say that. Your understanding is awesome because God's created you with the level of understanding that you can have. The dangerous thing is when you assume that it's something more than what it is. Then you become a huge danger to yourself. They said that whole the squirrel issue we talked about last Sunday. A sheep that thinks he's got it figured out is very dangerous to himself. Kill himself. All, all the right intentions. So, so God, in all of his questioning of Job, never answers Job's question. Tell me why. Never does, at least in the book of Job. Never explains to him. Takes all of his kids, all of his health, all of his wealth, and then has this conversation with Job in which he doesn't explain why and the things that we are privy to, by the way. We have this book. We're able to see what happened in heaven and the decisions why God did what he did. We may not like it. Like I said, it may be disturbing to us. Nonetheless, we at least have those things. Job, as far as we can tell, never got that information. Never did. And Job, smart guy. His capacity is, great, is, is equal to or greater than anyone in this room, or maybe all of us together, I would suggest to you. And yet God doesn't engender his intelligence. Say, yeah, Job, I built you to be really smart, so let me tell you what happened. Never does that. He never does, because here's why. He doesn't need Job to be smart. Not what he created you for. He doesn't need you to be smart. He needs you to trust him. That is what he created you for. He needs you to love him and feel his love. That's what he created you for. I got an elephant trying to fly. That'll never happen. You need to quit that if, that if you're that elephant. Stop it. Be an elephant. Be a human. 
That's what God created. He didn't create you to be some supernatural creature with vast intelligence. He created you with the capacity, though, to fully trust Him. Never does God demand that we fully understand Him, but He does demand that we fully trust Him. He does. Got it right. Because He can be trusted. And when we don't trust Him, you want to get on His bad side. That's the way to get on His bad side. That you don't trust me? He has a problem with that. God never demands that we understand Him. He does demand that we trust Him. His capacity, His, his infiniteness, all these things, we're never going to reach the end of that. It's never going to be with, it's not our, our ability to do that. Now, everybody from the Great Lakes region, we've got Michiganers and Minnesotans and Wisconsiners and Illinois, and you are among some of the biggest lakes, you know, in the world. You know, one of the largest lakes in the United States is not a part of the Great Lakes. Do you know where it is? You get a dollar. Where is it? It's Lake Tahoe. Yeah, it's in California. Who would have thought? One of the largest lakes by volume in the world is Lake Tahoe. It's the eighth deepest lake in the world. And that depth was determined by a couple of guys. I guess they ran out of booze because they filled their wine bottle with rocks and tied a string around it in July 4th, 1875, and they plumbed the depths of Lake Tahoe, found it to be 1,645 feet deep. Later, 100 years later, almost, determined by sonar, they were almost within a foot exactly correct. They weren't that drunk, I guess. <laughs> Very deep lake. The volume of that lake will blow your mind. Let me give you some stats. So if California is not a small state, this is part of California, right? It's on the border of California and Nevada, I believe. So California is not a small state. If you took Lake Tahoe today, turned it upside down, and poured it over the state of California, it would cover the state over 14 inches deep, the whole state. That's how much water is in it. That's a lot of water. Here's another stat for you. If we dipped out all the water and gave the, the water distributed to every single person, the millions of people who are uh, residents of these United States, they would have enough water, we would, to have 50 gallons of water per day for five years. That's a lot of water. The amount of water that evaporates off the surface of Lake Tahoe every year is enough water to, water, to provide all the water needs for a city the size of Los Angeles for five years. One year of evaporation. That's a lot of water. Now, of course, you Great Lakers know it's still not as big as, for instance, lakes. Why do we call it Lake Superior anyway? Right? Because it is. In fact, Lake Superior is 120 times larger by volume than Lake Tahoe. You don't want to dump that one out. It won't just flood California. It'll, you know, all of southern Canada and all of North America, half of North America, covered by a lot of water. 120 times larger Lake Superior, which, but it's still not the largest lake. The largest lake, Inland Lake, which is actually called the Sea, the Caspian Sea, is 576 times larger than Lake Tahoe. So the bottom line is, is that, for instance, Lake Tahoe, you'll never dip it out. All of us together. You'll never relinquish its supply. We just can't. There's too much of it. It's too big, it's too deep, and too much goes into it every year. You would just continue to dip out. But here's the thing about the lake is, though, even though it is vast, and it is, it is still limited. We know the measure of it. We know how wide, we know how deep, we know how long. We know how much water evaporates off of it. I've given you all the stats. How do they know those stats? Because they know how to measure it. So, so understand this when it comes to God. God is vast, right? He doesn't have a measure. You're never going to dip it all out. It's just not. That's okay. You don't want him to be dippable, if you will. You don't want to be able to dip him all out. You don't want a God like that. If you've got a God like that, listen, you need to find another God because that's not the God that you need. You need the infinite God who cannot be explained and fully understood by anyone, not the devil, not you, and not all of us together. You want a God who does things because he does things. But when he does it, it's always right. 
and that you can trust him for that. That is the God of the Bible. I don't want a God I can figure out, because if I can, well, then I'm chasing after the wrong God. That means he's a whole lot like me. In most days, I'm not worth much. I don't want a God like that. I don't. So we're going to stop right there. Questions? Book of Job. Somebody says, you're not going to go over the whole book of Job in eight studies. I said, well, yeah, I am. I'm just going to gloss over a bunch of it. Because <laughs> it is sort of redundant in some ways when you read those chapters, even though, man, they talk about some very heady, very intelligent things. Read those things. Read the descriptions in there of the animals that Job and his friends had seen with their eyeballs, or descriptions of in my opinion, dinosaurs. It's very interesting. Some of you have the NIV, and you may have the NIV that has side notes and stuff. And with all due respect to the interpreters of the NIV, they were also men and women. And they didn't have 100% correct, but they listened to one of these, the Leviathan that's described in there. The Hebrew calls, it, calls this creature Leviathan. says he has a tail like a tree trunk. And their conclusion in the margin is that this was talking about some kind of hippopotamus. I don't know what hippo y'all are dealing with, but all the ones I ever saw have these have a little pigtail on them. <laughs> so, so why, again, we're trying to force our conclusions of what we think the way world, the world is upon a scripture that tells us something different. Well, where are you getting your theology from? The theology is not I decide what it's going to be and I go to the Bible to prove it. That's not theology. That's euology. We don't need any of that. Theology is I go to the Bible with a blank slate, which is impossible to do. I know that. But where it disagrees with what I believed, I change. So they see dinosaurs. So guess what? Guess what? Now you believe the Bible? Well, Job and his friends saw dinosaurs. They are not, the descriptors there are not anything that lives on the earth today. We have fossil records of stuff like that. We don't have descriptive of things like that. And it may, may mess with you again, and maybe we need to deal with Genesis next time, and we'll talk about creation and all that, because I think that's a good thing. How many of you gone to, have anybody, has anybody gone to see the ark? Over there, Val and I are wanting to go, but it's a, quite a ways from here. <laughs> so, but the ark experience is supposed to be really, really good, and that Kent Hovind and those guys do a great job. Answers in Genesis, just uh, such, such a needed teaching because we've been beat over the head by um, so much uh, that erroneously is it called science that fa falls in the heading of evolution. It's just, it's idiocy. No questions? Jim. Thank you for teaching us. Yes, sir. It's been a real blessing. Good. <laughs> Good. My privilege. I enjoy it. Like I said, I'm writing a book. Y'all all have to buy it now, even though. <laughs> but I'm not ready for it. I need a sabbatical or something. I have time to get it all together. So I tend to run on with my thoughts, and then I find it again in the next chapter. I think, I think I said that. Can't remember. Yes, ma'am. Uh, what's your next study? Going to be? I don't know. So I'm not. This is it. This is the end of winter Texan season, and so we end on Tuesday. This is our last Tuesday together. And so I will, I actually I do know I'm going to be starting on Sunday night. So, so our, our area, our church is, because our area is very seasonal. So we have a winter Texan season, which is, which is culminated in a, we have, the, we have the change from the gray hairs to the purple, blue, and yellow hairs, you know, <laughs> coming up in two weeks. We'll be flooded by them, and they kind of is a, it's sort of a reset around here because a lot of our church and all of you guys, most of you leave. Uh, so it's, and then we all kind of come back together, and so the springtime for the island is sort of a back to the locals who live here, and we're able to get to church. And I say that seriously because, like, during spring break, a lot of times you won't, you won't if you're not on the island, if you're on the island, you won't be able to get off of it. If you're off the island, you won't be able to get onto it because the crowds are so, so bad. When summer starts, it also is that way, especially on Sundays, Saturdays and Sundays. And so for a while, we tried to have Sunday night services because I was, you know, a good old Baptist boy. We had church. When you have church? Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night. Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night. Well, in the summertime, you can do that, but you're only, the only people that can actually get here in time are your people that live on the island. That's only about a third of my population of our congregation. So basically cutting off two-thirds that really just can't. Who's going to drive two hours to listen to me? Especially now, you can sit and watch me online, so... So I have Wednesday services, but I have them by myself in here. I teach on, on Wednesdays. I teach you the Bible study right now. We're in, the first, we're in 1 Corinthians. But it's just me in here by myself teaching that. 
And so it afforded us a lot of things being able to be online. But start, anyway, starting in the middle of March, end of March, we'll start a Sunday night service, which is going to be like this one, sort of. Question and answer. We'll have, uh, it'll be a lot longer than Sunday mornings. It's a whole lot more teaching uh, as opposed to preaching. Sunday mornings, I'm limited to about 30, 45 minutes because we have back-to-back -back services. And so, uh, but we're going to be looking into actually a sermon series by, um, what's his name? No. Anyway, by some good preacher. <laughs> and I'm going to be stealing his stuff and writing some of my stuff in and giving him full credit for all of it. Just because he says, he, he says some things that I think really need to be said. And it'd be just, I mean, in my opinion, it might as well just put his tape up here and we can watch it, but it's, it's not as effective, huh? David Jeremiah, there you go. Great preacher. Love him. Where do, where, it's, it's the study of where do we go from here. And if you haven't gotten it, get it. The guy is on it. As far as where we are in these United States, as far as where we are and the, and the direction things are headed, and the things that we're forgetting about socialism, about Marxism, about all these things, and where we are, class, we're in a classic cycle here, moving into socialism and Marxism. This is not the first time it's happened to a country. We'll be talking about that. This is not going to be a political statement and... and uh, you know what I say if we go to Marxism cap from capitalism? Oh, well. I mean, I hate it as an American. But I'm not called to be an American. I'm called to be a son of God. And I, I have to, we have to bear the testimony of God. And, we, so, so, and that's David Jeremiah's position as well. He just says, listen, where do we go from here? In other words, what, how, how do we, in the, in the changing times, how, how do we adjust so that we can be the people that God has called us to be? Because we only have a short life. And it's the bottom, the bottom line is not that we leave this world, you know, saving America. The bottom line is we leave this world by saving Americans, or and everybody else for that matter. So we need to be very careful. So David Jeremiah, is that what you were asking? Oh, no, I was wondering what the name of your book is going to be. Yeah, I don't know, the book of Job, no? <laughs> maybe maybe a disturbing conclusions, since I use that a whole lot. So from Job. Yes, sir, David. They come for your guns, are you going to give them up? What? They come for your guns. You if they come for my guns, that's a good, good question. Am I going to give them up? Uh, I'd have to say right now, yes. Yeah, it'll break my heart. But my Bible tells me that I have to follow the laws of the land. It doesn't say I have to, doesn't say it now. Again, where, where does rebellion come in? And I know our four, we're all here except for the three Canadians. The rest of us are a bunch of rebels. We're descended from rebels who threw off the tyranny, you know, and all that, and fought the Civil War. We all have this background of, you know, and, and so we have to be really careful when we go through, especially stressful times, that we know our Bibles really, really well. The Bible doesn't say that I deserve to have guns. Like I said, I, I'd have thought more of God, more of God too. I can't believe he didn't own guns, but he didn't. He's called me to be a son of God, an evangelist, and a message carrier. And if that means I have to get rid of my guns to do it, yep, I'm going to do it. Now, again, can God call a person to stand for his rights and, and, and be a testimony, you know, under those circumstances from jail? Well, then, yeah. And maybe God will do that for me. I don't know. But as it stands right now, if they come by and say, because obviously the only ones who are going to obey the laws are law keepers, and I'm a one of those. By God's, by God's rules, I have, to keep his, I have to keep the laws of the land. So if they make rules like that, I have to keep them. And if I can't keep them, I'll have to move somewhere else. But then I'm going to have to hear from God to tell me that I, that's what I'm supposed to do. Because right now I'm called to America and to Baptist churches. That's the only place I've been. So I hope I'm dead before that happens. It's coming, though, David, it is. It's going to be a decision for... Uh, it's already been a decision that had been made by Canadians. I know that. We had Canadians that were telling me 15 years ago uh, that they were, bring, they were going to smuggle all their guns across the border and bring them to me. And I thought, Wow. <laughs> So now we're going to both be in the penitentiary. <laughs> That'll be great. So, but it's headed, you know, it's headed our way. Of course, this happened in Australia. It's happened in these, uh, in, in the Commonwealth nations. And even though we don't want to think of ourselves that way, that's what we are as well, guys. English, English Commonwealth nations, all of us. So it's headed our way. Our, our cultures are the same. So, yeah, David, you have. Would, would God be mad at, mad at us if we? Uh... Kept their gun and fought from a house, yeah. shot from every window. I don't know. You know, that's, that's a decision that you've got to make before God because obviously 
I have a lot to be grateful for from, from men and women who did that. So, and, and for me to sit back and say, well, it was wrong for them to do that. Okay, but, you know, here I am preaching in a church with no, at least not yet, nobody uh, reining me in, and I've got a right to go and own guns, and I've got all kinds of incredible rights because these men and women fought and died to make sure that I'm here. So it's not a, it's not a cut and dry, it's not a cut and dry decision. It's, it's sort of back to not to stir the pot here. And maybe, it, maybe I should, but maybe I just will anyway, because then I can just say, okay, it's over, y'all can go home. But the whole issue of vaccines and all that stuff that we've had this past year. And, uh, you know, some people wanted me as a pastor to draw a line on that. And my uh, drawing the line on that is this. You need, to be perfect, you need to be perfectly convicted yourself what you need to do and do that. And don't tell me what to do because I'm certainly not going to tell you what to do. That, that is your life. And you, and by the way, no, I shouldn't say that. It is, your, it is the life that God has given to you and the body has given to you. And you need to take care of it as best as he leads you to. And do that, whatever that is. You got to wear a mask all the time, great. Stay home, great. Whatever God's calling you to do, make sure it's not as much as possible. Like I said, it's impossible to rule all, all the influences of the world. Make sure that all the clatter that's out there is out, and I'm just simply listening. This is what I believe God wants me to do with my life. Okay. Super good. We need to allow ourselves to be that, and it's sort, it's sort of, sort of, we're sort of already facing some of those questions, I think, now to a certain degree, David, and we're kind of learning and maybe a precursor to some, some bigger questions that are, I think it really is, some bigger questions that are coming. Yes, ma'am? Suppose it's your Bible. I'm sorry? Suppose it's your Bible. Suppose to take away my Bible, yeah. I'm going to have to die with that one. I will die for that one. And that'll happen. So it just goes, it goes with all the rights, you know. Because they don't, you know, the, the, the issue of tyranny is that you can't think for yourself. So I can't own a gun, and I can't think, and I can't make my decisions for myself. And that's the issue of tyranny. And so it, it has to come down to the Bible because if you control, if you can't control the Bible, you can't control the world. I mean, you ask, no, no offense to any Catholics here, but ask the Catholic Church how they ruled uh, Europe and really the known world. They did it by the restriction of information. No Bibles. And so when they, they would keep them locked in pulpits. And so the guy up here would tell you how to think. You keep them dumb and you keep them down. And we'll go back to America and why we rebelled and came over here because we got Bibles. Turns us into a bunch of rebels to a certain degree. It really does. Because, you know, we say, wait a minute. That's not true. You've been lying to us all these years, taking our money for stuff that's false. Now people get mad. So all the mad people came to America. Here we are. <laughs> that's the truth. It's an absolute truth. And we got, we got mad at each other. We came up with a bunch of rules, you know, and we don't, we have to do this, we have to do that, we have to, you know. And it's been great. It's been a good run. I'm afraid it's over, though. I really am. It needs to be okay. You know, God's sovereign, isn't he? He's in charge. So it's not, gonna, it's, not going, it's not going to get better. It has to get worse, far worse. So when you're asking, again, he taught us to pray, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. You're asking for a bloodbath. So that's what it is. The rebellion of the human soul is in, in rebellion against God ultimately. And God is going to put that down. He prefers for us to bow the knee. Willingly. But either way, you're going to bow it. So either to the blood of Jesus or to your own blood, but you will bow. That's coming, to be sure. Something else. All right, perfectly clear. huh? <laughs> so the book will be better, because I'll have a lot more time to think about and go back and say, no, that's not right. <laughs> so it will be better. I just don't know when it's going to be finished. But then, I, you know, if, if you've ever written a book, you finish it, and then you go back over it and think, what in the world? I don't know why I said that. And then you go back, and then you wait too much, you go back over it again, and you're thinking, what in the world? That was not, and that doesn't even make sense. So, all right, let's pray. God, we thank you so much for teaching us. Thank you, God, uh, for the humbling experience we've had through the book of Job. Uh, what a great man. What a mighty man. We could certainly, if we want to aspire to be uh, great people, we certainly need to be like him. He was a man who trusted you. He was a man who understood that uh, you give because it's your stuff and you take it away because it's your stuff. That even if we're the best we can be, we still are not worthy of a single good thing that you bring into our lives and all the good that we have is because you're being kind to us. 
you're being gracious to us, you're, you're benevolent to us. If you were evil, if you were um, not uh, benevolent, there would be nothing that we could do. But the fact is, is that you're completely, uh, you completely love us, you're completely trustworthy, you completely can be trusted to do the right thing in us, even in the short term, if it seems wrong, it's still the right thing. So God, we trust you with our lives, we, we recommit ourselves to you, we commit our troubles and our trials and our struggles and the things that we can't explain and that we don't understand and that put our hearts in uh, a great quandary. We want to speak over those things, God, that you're trustworthy, that, that you know what you're doing, and that it's going to be good uh, when it's all said and done. Because you're in charge, God, we know these things are true. So thank you for this time, God. I pray you bless the understanding of it and the, the mulling it over, Lord, in the, in the days and weeks to come. Thank you, God. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thanks for visiting. Find us at www.islandbaptistchurch.org.